Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. My name is Melissa Lowe. I'm a research fellow at the NUS Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions, and I'll be the host and moderator for this afternoon. Uh, again, just want to say thank you uh, very much to everyone for taking the time out of your very busy schedules to come and be with us today. Um, so before we begin, uh, we'd like to uh, show a video of uh, NUS President Professor Tan Ing Chai, uh, who has recorded some opening remarks uh, for us today. Good afternoon to everyone. I'm happy to open this inaugural lecture of the NUS COP27 lecture series organized by our Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. The Conference of Parties 27, or COP27 as it's commonly known as, will take place this November at Sham al-Sheikh, Egypt. COP27 will bring world governments together to accelerate global efforts to confront climate change. The latest science shows that a warming world is increasingly disrupting ecosystems and communities, and we need to reduce carbon emissions quickly in the broader context of getting to net zero. Climate change presents many complex multidisciplinary challenges. As universities, we are at the forefront of scientific and technological research, and this offers us a great vantage point to drive research, create impactful change, and seize opportunities to test cutting-edge solutions by serving as living laboratories for experimentation. To get to net zero emissions, global efforts are needed to reduce energy consumption and adopt higher efficiency technologies replace fossil fuels with renewable energy as soon as viable, and remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere to offset emissions that are hard to abate. NUS has been stepping up on our research relating to net zero on all these fronts. We have made good progress in working with various industry players through the Sustainable Tropical Data Center Test Bait Consortium to reduce the energy needs of this growing sector. We established the Center for Hydrogen Innovations to investigate how to make hydrogen a commercially viable source of renewable energy and tackle some of the key technological and infrastructural challenges in enabling a hydrogen economy. Eight NUS research teams were given grants under the Singapore government's Low Carbon Energy Research Funding Initiative to pursue projects in hydrogen and carbon capture utilization and storage. Collectively, we strive to be a note of excellence for hydrogen research for greater impact. Now, complementing this effort is the research at the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions in conserving, restoring, and better managing ecosystems such as forests, mangroves, and oceans, which help to remove carbon dioxide from the atmosphere. We not only worked on solutions for global climate challenges, NUS develops capabilities that also address national priorities. NUS and the Agency for Science, Technology and Research jointly opened the Technology Center for Offshore and Marine Science, or TCOMS, which supports the maritime and oceanic industries. TCOMS will also contribute to the work in coastal adaptation to climate change as part of Singapore's climate resilience agenda. Given the threats of rising sea levels and storm surges in the years ahead. Additionally, we continue to use the university grounds as a testbed for innovative carbon reduction and replacement technologies. The recently announced capital infrastructure 
and U.S. Low Carbon Living Laboratory. We will leverage our Kenridge campus to scale up the deployment of distributed energy management, integration of solar photovoltaics, thermal energy storage, electrical microgrids, as well as charging stations for electrical vehicles. This will also provide educational and training opportunities for NUS students, as well as opportunities for open collaboration with other ecosystem players such as startups, SMEs, and researchers. As educational institutions, universities can reshape ways of thinking and operating so that climate action becomes a priority. This involves equipping our undergraduates, regardless of their major, with the requisite knowledge and skills to address a sustainable future. We do this through our interdisciplinary course offerings at the colleges and faculties, as well as broad-based general education curriculum that most undergraduates take. We recently revamped the general education curriculum and introduce a new communities and engagement pillar where students will have a hand in coming up with solutions to tackle societal needs and real world issues including threats to the environment. NUS is also making progress and on track to our goal of being a carbon neutral campus by 2030. Last year, SDE4, which is Singapore's first purpose-built net-zero energy building, has generated more energy than it consumes and has been recognized by the Building and Construction Authority with a green mark in Operation Platinum Positive Energy Award. Now, all these efforts are being guided by the University's Sustainability and Climate Action Council comprising NUS faculty, researchers, educators, and administrators to look at how NUS can further integrate and scale our work in research, education, operations, and engagement for greater impact. Council members possess expertise across a wide range of areas relating to environment, from the climate sciences to green finance, behavioral economics, engagement, and research leadership. We hope that this multi-pronged approach will allow us to respond nimbly amidst rapid changes as we chart the path forward. As with previous years since 2014, NUS will be represented at COP as an accredited research and independent non-governmental organization. At COP27, the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions will be working closely with our government representatives and is organizing and participating in a number of panel discussions at its Singapore pavilion. NUS will also be represented by colleagues from the Lee Kuan Yew School of Public Policy and the Center for International Law. Together, we will be helping build and inspire a future of green possibilities for Singapore. The pressing work of climate change actions will be a complex but worthy one. NUS is happy that in fulfilling our commitment to sustainability, we can also support the national climate agenda and catalyze solutions for global challenges. I would like to encourage everyone to join this race to shape a greener future. I hope you will find inspiration from this NUS COP27 lecture series to start, deepen, or augment your green journey. In closing, I would like to thank Prof. Kolian Pin for inviting me to be part of this lecture. I wish everyone a fruitful session, and I hope to see you in person soon. Thank you.
And that was uh, NUS President Professor Tan Eng Chai delivering the opening remarks for our lecture. And now it gives me great pleasure to invite the Director for the NUS Centre for Nature-Based Climate Solutions for our opening remarks. Prof Ko, please. Uh, thanks, thanks, Melissa. Uh, very well, well, welcome to everyone. A very good afternoon. It's uh, good to see uh, real people uh, for a change uh, and, and uh, for spending the afternoon with us. I'd also like to uh, thank uh, President Tan for his remarks. Uh, some of our friends, our supporters, um, our, our colleagues from the NUS Pacific Center for Environmental Law, uh, the Center for International Law, as well as the WWF Singapore for helping us put together this exciting uh, lecture series. Um, on, also on behalf uh, of my colleagues uh, at the center, uh, I extend our uh, gratitude and our thanks to uh, those who are wanting to come and maybe for some reason have not been able to make it. Uh, we will be sharing uh, recordings of, of this session uh, with, with, them, with them. Maybe, what I'll do now is also to talk a little bit uh, and introduce you to the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions. Uh, I think you've heard uh, that being mentioned a few, sorry, a few times by the president. Uh, and maybe some of you are already familiar with uh, CNCS, our center. Uh, for those of you who are aren't, um, uh, the center or CNCS is uh, quite a young center. It was set up two years ago uh, when I uh, came back to Singapore. It is a focal point for world-class research, uh, very interdisciplinary. We bring together colleagues and expertise from all over the university, different departments, different faculties. In fact, we have uh, our colleagues from other universities as well who are our research affiliates. And, and this uh, diversity of uh, expertise is really needed uh, to address our challenges, uh, not just climate challenge, but also our many other challenges, food security, um, uh, energy challenge, and, and so on and so forth. Um, so the, fo the focus is to respond uh, appropriately and decisively to challenges and opportunities of climate change. And our mission is to deliver new technologies and new knowledge and new solutions, of course, to inform policy strategies and actions uh, to realize our vision and our purpose. And it is actually with our vision and our mission in mind that uh, brought us here today. And as uh, President Tan mentioned earlier in his uh, introductory speech, um, in COP27, um, following many countries' pledges and commitments to limiting global warming to below, uh, well below two degrees Celsius, uh, we hope to accelerate global efforts uh, in the fight against climate change, including uh, reviewing these countries' uh, national ambitions, NDCs, the nationally determined contributions and also to uh, enhance the global agenda for action on adaptation and analyzing the progress on climate finance. Uh, what is NUS's role at COP27? Uh, apart from uh, what President had already mentioned, um, I also want to emphasize that a team of us from NUS, uh, from different faculties, will participate at COP27. We'll all be part of the NUS contingent. In fact, we'll all be part of the Singapore contingent uh, because universities have a crucial role to play in helping the world to achieve our climate goals. As institutions of research, innovation, and education, uh, we are helping to navigate the complexities of climate change and strengthen the development and delivery of climate solutions. Now, um, now as a leading research and education institution, NUS will be at COP27 to showcase our research and innovation and also our partnerships with other agencies and stakeholders in Singapore and, and beyond Singapore uh, provide uh, our thoughts, our thought leadership, our commentary on various climate issues, uh, increasing access to COP27 through public outreach and communications, and helping to foster the collaborative efforts needed to bolster uh, our collective climate action. Now, we can continue to explore how we as a university can contribute to a successful and impactful COP and inspire climate action, and this lecture series is one of the ways through which uh, we hope to contribute. I think I will not take up uh, too much time. Uh, in conclusion, I hope this series provides all of you with a deeper understanding of COP27, and you will come out of this series informed and inspired for the coming COP. Thank you very much. Thank you, Prof. Ko, uh, for your opening remarks. 
So I just want to share with you how the format of today's lecture will be. So we have two speakers today, Ruben and Anshari, and uh, they will each be speaking for about 20 minutes, and then we will have the panel discussion where I invite all of you to think about questions and also uh, raise your hand and we'll ask them later and uh, my colleagues will be in the aisles uh, passing the mics across or you can go and line up at the, at the mics. Okay, so um, let me introduce our first speaker for this afternoon. Uh, Mr. Ruben Manokara is the Assistant Director, Global Partnerships at the National Climate Change Secretariat. Ruben fosters bilateral and multilateral negotiations on carbon markets and low carbon technologies. He is Singapore's lead negotiator for Article 6 at the UNFCCC Related Fora. Pleased to have you here today, Ruben. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, let me start first by um, thanking Prof. Ko and NUS and CNCS for putting this together. I think such platforms are great. Uh, it brings together a diversity of thought and it's exactly what we need uh, to solve the problem of climate change collectively. Today, uh, I'll be sharing about Article 6 as what the, uh, uh, this work, uh, seminar is about. But I thought uh, it would be useful to reflect on an anecdote of mine. When I started this journey of negotiating Article 6 on behalf of Singapore, um, Many of you might know that carbon markets can be a rabbit hole of taxonomy, complex concepts, terms that you don't quite understand. And what had helped me very early on um, in my journey was to take a step back and ask myself two questions. Firstly, why do we do it? And how do we do it? And representing the government, I thought of it through the lens of Singapore, so I thought it would be useful to start from that perspective to share on what Article 6 means for Singapore and how does Singapore aim to implement and operationalize Article 6. So, related to why we do it, I think the, a useful starting point is to understand Singapore's overall climate strategy and where Article 6 fits in that picture. Um, during budget this year, um, we made a significant announcement uh, that we will achieve net zero by and around mid-century. Um, we also said that we will commit towards a definitive year after consulting key stakeholders, uh, which we have done, and we will release uh, the findings of that fairly soon. But what was critical uh, that gave us the confidence to um, make that announcement um, were, were actually two areas. Um, in starting with the why we can make the announcement. Firstly, um, there was a shift, a significant shift at COP26 uh, because of two developments. Firstly, after six long years of uh, predecessors of mine negotiating Article 6, um, globally we managed to finalize the Paris rule book and that includes the uh, global rules on um, carbon markets. And second, uh, there was almost a shift at COP, uh, and COP almost appeared to be, in some extent, uh, a green Davos of sorts. Uh, there were companies, finances, banks, uh, well represented at COP, uh, making uh, bold announcements on investments towards low carbon technology. And as you know, Singapore being a country with a very low mitigation potential and being very alternative energy disadvantaged, uh, these developments gave us the confidence uh, to make this announcement. But that beyond this, there's also reasons why we should take more uh, bold steps towards uh, greater climate ambition. Uh, firstly, there are positive benefits. Uh, there are positive benefits uh, from leveraging sustainable finance and getting corporates to pursue um, their net zero targets. These benefits include making Singapore more attractive uh, and developing a green economy. And this has knock-on opportunities um, both uh, across different fields, uh, legal, economic, social, and so on and so forth. So that brings us to the topic of the day, uh, which is about uh, Article 6. And the starting point for carbon markets is uh, the pricing of carbon. And as part of the announcements at uh, Budget 2022, uh, we announced that we will right price carbon to provide a clear signal for businesses and individuals. And progressively, from now till 2030, we will increase the carbon price from a floor of currently $5 up to $25 at 2024 and uh, 
at forty-five dollars at twenty twenty-six, and between fifty to eighty at uh, twenty thirty. So this is the starting point of why we do it. Now, elaborating on the environment, the context that Singapore is in, essentially there are, there are three trusts to Singapore's strategy with regard to achieving this goal. Um, firstly, is our domestic transformation in industry, economy, and society. And that, a key part of that involves the adoption of low carbon and um, advanced technologies. Uh, as shared by Melissa, part of what, what we do in the office is also to secure uh, low carbon opportunities and technologies. This includes the areas of hydrogen, CCS, CCUS, and energy imports, for example. But a key part of our thrust is e effective international collaboration. Singapore being small and, and an island, a city state, uh, with very little natural resources, we rely on international collaboration to bring some of these plans uh, into reality. So that's where markets come in. Again, recalling another anecdote, um, earlier this year, uh, in fact, a couple of weeks ago, uh, Senior Minister Teo uh, was on a visit to Cairo uh, as part of a regular bilateral. And during one of the visits, there was a, a question post on carbon markets, and it went along the lines of, essentially, markets is about financing. My perspective is carb carbon markets is essentially about ambition. It's about enabling climate ambition and using markets as a tool to enable the ambition. And it's from that st starting point that the government views carbon markets. And it's really about developing a tool that allows for the financing and subsequently implementing of carbon projects that effectively reduce or remove greenhouse gas emissions. And to do that in a market efficient way. Uh, I spoke about the mitigation potential of countries. So this is a important concept to recognize of how different countries have different abilities and different potential to achieve abatement purely through domestic measures. And Singapore uh, has very low mitigation potential because of the constraints that we mentioned. And we're not alone in, in having that view. Uh, for example, um, in AITA's study, it's about three years since the study, but it's still relevant, right? Uh, so if harnessed uh, properly, the global carbon market can uh, essentially reduce more than half of, uh, or rather contribute to the reduction of more than uh, half of uh, the current NDCs at that time, and also facilitate the removal of more than 50% of emissions by 2030. So it's definitely a tool that if harnessed properly, can lead to genuine and real abatement. So next, what does carbon credits mean for countries beyond Singapore? Uh, so the, the perspective is that uh, carbon markets enable a win-win situation. Beyond achieving, uh, helping countries um, achieve their emission reductions, carbon markets can result in abatement sharing between host country and user country. So to cite you a very practical example, uh, typically a crediting project is anywhere from 5, 10, or more realistically 20 years. Throughout that period, uh, as the current rules for Article 6 stands, a, a country that's buying credits is not allowed to bank credits. It means you can't buy credits beyond your NDC period. So there's a current limit to how much you can buy. But very often, these projects that are invested in have a, have a life cycle of way beyond the crediting period. So that's where abatement sharing comes in. So even though credits are procured during the period of the NDC, beyond that, it's a host country that then achieves that abatement and can, can effect greater reductions in greenhouse gas emissions. Lastly, and my perspective is that this is, this is an aspect not frequently uh, spoken about, but carbon markets can enable very real uh, sustainable development goals. So by, for example, investing in forestry projects or technology solutions, um, carbon markets can play a role in green transition as well as helping local indigenous communities, for example. Uh, and increase uh, living standards and livelihoods. So coming to the second question that I said, uh, that I spoke about earlier of how we do it. Essentially, um, how Singapore implements carbon markets is through our carbon tax. Uh, we have announced that uh, companies may surrender currently up to 5% of their taxable emissions um, through high quality carbon credits uh, from 2024 onwards. 
The intent of this is to cushion the carbon tax impact for companies so that um, if they are able to secure carbon credits in a cost-effective manner. Saying that, um, as per the concept of carbon credits and carbon markets, domestic abatement remains our priority. And the use of credits um, is, uh, is earmarked for hard to abate sectors or as a, as a time-based measure where we need time for technologies to catch up with abatement measures. And there is a second goal of, of how we do it as well. So the goal is to transform Singapore into a carbon services and trading hub and carbon markets is an enabler for it. So carbon markets enables us to create an ecosystem of investors, verifiers, exchanges, bankers, traders, lawyers that, that interact in this space and allows us to transform the economy into a green economy. So I believe this is my last slide on how we do it. So I spoke about this in my first slide, that essentially Article 6 gave us confidence because it resulted in the operation, operationalization of two key uh, mechanisms. Firstly, it's the Article 6.2 mechanism. So uh, for those not familiar with the Article 6 rules, this is essentially bilateral cooperation between countries where they agree on a framework taking into account the multilateral agreement on Article 6.2 and they develop a framework where uh, carbon credits are, are traded. Right? So there are, there are currently uh, existing mechanisms for it. For example, Japan has a joint crediting mechanism. Uh, the Swiss and uh, Ghana, for example, are in very advanced stages of negotiations, uh, negotiations to, to operationalize their bilateral mechanism. And so is Singapore. And I'll share about this in, in my next slide where I have some photos of it. Uh, and the other mechanism is the Article 6.4 mechanism. So this is um, somewhat similar but hopefully an improvement from the clean development mechanism uh, that used to be operational under the Kyoto Protocol. So this is a centralized mechanism under UNFCCC um, and is currently in the stage of development after a, a long period of limbo of a few months. Uh, the Article 6.4 supervisory body uh, has finally convened twice and they have started developing uh, methodologies um, and rules to govern this system. So hopefully it will be operationalized somewhere between 2023 and 2024. Or rather that's the timeline that they're working towards. Good thing is that um, Singapore is actively playing a role in both mechanisms. So we have actively pursued Article 6.2 engagements with numerous countries. And we have signed MOUs, for example, with uh, Morocco, um, Indonesia um, and uh, Colombia. So, and we're also an active part of a 6.4 supervisory body. So we, we see um, to the far left um, of the group photo of the, at the UNFCCC, you see um, our di Director General of Climate Change, Benedict. So he plays an active role um, at the supervisory body. So with that, um, thank you for the time again for this and looking forward to your questions and engagements. Thank you very much, Ruben, for that insightful sharing. Um, next up, we have our second speaker. Um, I'd like to introduce him. Uh, Mr. Anshari Rahman is the Vice President for Climate Change Strategy at, no, I think it's the wrong one, right? Uh, at Tomasek International, Gen Zero. Yeah, I know. <laughs> um, okay, so he covers um, impact investments across uh, carbon markets value chains. Um, prior to that, Anshari was a climate change negotiator in the Singapore government uh, with over 10 years of experience in multilateral negotiations and policy making. Uh, and he, was, he had represented the Singapore government at various multilateral fora, such as the UNFCCC, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, IPCC, and ASEAN. Um, and with that, I'd like to uh, invite Anshari up to the stage, please. Um, thank you, Melissa, uh, for the introduction. In short, I was um, Ruben's unfortunate predecessor. <laughs> uh, but, but first, let me thank NUS um, for inviting me to speak. Um, it, it's great to speak to an audience um, and hope we ha can have a very good discussion. Um, so by way of background, I'm actually Anshari Rahman, um, VP of uh, Strategy and Development Group under Gen Zero. 
uh, we are a Tamase owned company with a $5 billion initial capital to look at deployment across decarbonization solutions. And just a short plug on Gen Zero, uh, we deploy our capital across three pillars. The first one on tech-based solutions, uh, looking at engineering solutions, uh, particularly frontier ones that can help with uh, decarbonization efforts towards net zero. Um, the second pillar is around nature-based solutions, uh, how we can actually deploy up, upstream capital into projects um, that can protect and restore natural ecosystems. Uh, this will include uh, forestry, sustainable agriculture, as well as very new areas such as blue carbon, as well as uh, carbon ecosystem enablers. Uh, now, this can sound like a fairly vacuous term, uh, but it essentially means companies that can help accelerate and scale the carbon markets. Right? Um, so you can see the profile of some of our companies under our portfolio. <laughs> Um, this is a snapshot of the carbon market's history. Right? So the voluntary carbon market has actually existed since early 2000s alongside compliance market. And in the past, uh, they've kind of existed in two different worlds. Um, so we've got compliance market under the UNFCCC, um, really from the clean development mechanism, where developed countries can actually deploy or finance projects in developing countries and the credits used towards their Kyoto Protocol targets. Uh, we've also got uh, markets regulated by uh, various jurisdictions, such as the EU ETS and the China ETS. Um, one thing to note, uh, in terms of the size itself, compliance market last year was valued at about $751 billion. Um, in comparison, voluntary carbon market, we are hearing a lot today that uh, they've been valued at $2 billion. So relatively, it's quite a jarring spread. But also to note that um, out of this $751 billion in terms of the value of the compliance market, 90% is actually EU emissions trading scheme. Uh, and the EU emissions trading scheme currently for the current phase, they do not allow any use of international carbon offsets. So it will be quite interesting to see how um, the markets kind of converge um, uh, in the next decade. Right? Um, uh, the value of the voluntary carbon market really is um, uh, driven by uh, a lot of net zero uh, targets by corporates in the past two years. And so this momentum has generated significant demand for carbon credits. Um, and as I mentioned, there's an intersection between the compliance and the voluntary market. We are seeing a blurring today um, and a greater scrutiny on the role of offsets. Right? Is it just about offsetting? What exactly is the role of offsets in decarbonization? And we are increasingly seeing a shift in focus um, on scrutiny on both the demand and supply side. Uh, you need quality on both the demand and supply of carbon credits, and which is why you're observing initiatives in the voluntary carbon market to try and uh, enhance governance or harmonize some of these standards around the quality of credits, but also the types of claims that you can make. Um, at the regulators, for the regulators, they are also increasing scrutiny on the kind of offsets that corporates use, uh, and that's why you are observing a lot of uh, disclosure initiatives uh, where corporates will need to kind of um, uh, reveal or disclose or report uh, the, the use of credits uh, within their uh, decarbonization journeys. Um, there is a blurred boundary. Uh, typically in the past, uh, the voluntary carbon market serves the private sector uh, demand. Uh, but today, uh, we are observing like COSIA, which is an uh, international compliance scheme under ICAO. They do allow uh, voluntary credits. Um, but of course, some of the rules under Article 6 will apply to other international mitigation purposes. If you're a climate geek like me, uh, you would know what other international mitigation purposes mean. Right? It's a hook for um, international compliance schemes like COSIA and potentially IMO if they do adopt a market-based measure in future. And I'll go into this a bit more later. Um, you would require corresponding adjustments for post-2021 vintages. Um, the other point is that we are increasingly seeing uh, jurisdictions implementing or introducing carbon pricing mechanisms, either carbon tax or emissions trading schemes. Uh, and pretty sure the scope of these uh, carbon pricing schemes will expand. You might cover one sector today. In future, it might cover economy-wide. Right? Um, you might have a price of $5 today. 2027, 20, 2030, 20, uh, you might go $50 to $80. So with these two developments, there is increasing relevance in terms of some kind of flexibility mechanisms for liable co companies to actually use international offsets. Right? For some, they might look at domestic offsets generated from sectors that are not covered in their emissions training schemes. 
So in terms of navigating the space, it's going to be a fairly complex space. Um, when, when, what kind of credits can be used towards what kind of targets and users. Um, and also carbon becoming a sovereign asset. Uh, what I've heard in the space or in the industry, they say uh, nationalization of carbon. Right? I wouldn't go to, so far to say it's a nationalization of carbon, but because today all countries have NDCs and targets, including net zero targets, you will have to think twice about how much you want to export right, and what you need for your domestic needs. And this is where some of the accounting things can become quite tricky. Right? Um, we are seeing restrictions on exports, a levy supply, and um, some kind of sharing of credits arrangements between countries that can be a win-win solution. This is actually not new. Um, today, actually, in a bilateral scheme um, done by Japan, the Joint Crediting Mechanism, there is already a sharing of emission reductions between the host country and Japan. Right? Um, but this is a form of win-win model uh, moving forward. So it's no longer going to be transactional. There needs to be benefits that go back to the host country, but also to the local communities. Um, Ruben has covered this under Article 6. So actually, he mentioned 6.4 and 6.2. 6.2 covers bilateral schemes. So if Singapore cooperates with, um, let's say, Mexico, right, uh, and a bilateral scheme that, co that is covered under 6.2, and 6.2 essentially requires you, the governance is up to the countries that participate in that particular cooperative approach, but you need to report in a transparent manner. And that's really the key under Article 6. And that's why we managed to get uh, consensus last year. Right? Um, it's all about trust and confidence. You can do what you want, but you need to be transparent. And whatever that you report must be clear and will be scrutinized, reviewed by expert panel, and available for international and public scrutiny. Right. Um, so that's 6.2. 6.4 is a mechanism, a new and improved CDM mechanism. The other one that I want to mention is 6.8. So 6.8 um, in the negotiation space has taken kind of a backseat in terms of spotlight because a lot of attention has been placed on 6.2 and 6.4, which are market-based mechanisms. But 6.8 could potentially play a very important role in future. Um, it is actually a concept that represents all kinds of international cooperation that doesn't uh, involve a market-based mechanism. Right. So in a typical red plus scenario, some might be familiar with the red plus mechanism under the UNFCCC. The red plus mechanism itself, the framework itself, is actually a results-based finance, right, where a particular developed country um, pays uh, or, or finances a developing country uh, projects based on the emission reductions that have been avoided. Right. Actually, the credits are not issued under the red plus framework. It is then layered over or some of the mechanisms and standards uh, adopt some of the red plus uh, framework and then add on additional safeguards around permanence, leakage, right, to, to try and uh, make sure that whatever credits are generated represent real additional permanent emission reductions. Um, corresponding adjustment, I'm sorry for the abbreviations, but CA stands for corresponding adjustments. And this is one of the key paradigm shifts from Kyoto Protocol to Paris Agreement. So under the Kyoto Protocol, only developed countries or Annex 1 parties have targets and obligations under the agreement. Developing countries do not have. And in that uh, particular framework or regime, uh, under the Clean Development Mechanism, a particular offset project, when the credits are generated and used by a developed country towards their Kyoto Protocol target, uh, the developing country, because they do not have any target, there is um, no double counting of sorts because they do not have any obligations. Right? Moving forward under the Paris Agreement, because every country now has an NDC, there needs to be a mechanism such that um, the emission reductions do not count towards two NDC targets. And this is quite important. Um, because today there's a big debate, at least in the voluntary carbon markets world, whether or not corresponding adjustments should apply for voluntary uh, corporate targets. And we can go down into a rabbit hole of the accounting, but suffice to say, uh, for international mitigation purposes, uh, corresponding adjustments would be required. Uh, that, would re that would refer to uh, credits that are being used by other countries towards their NDCs, or by airlines towards their COSIA obligations for post-2021 vintages, um, and also to IMO if, let's say, they do adopt a market-based measure. The rationale underpinning this is that global GHG emissions are aggregated from countries' GHG inventories, as well as sectoral emissions from international aviation and maritime. 
right? And corporate scope one to scope three emissions are very much embedded within national GHG inventories and also the sectoral emissions. So um, that is the argument made. Um, however, of course, there are different schools of thought. So as part of the cause for the negotiations, what we call constructive ambiguity, um, <laughs> we leave it up to countries to decide uh, whether or not they want to authorize the credits and for what use this could be uh, used towards, right? Uh, what is clear is that if you want to use any credits towards your NDC or towards other international mitigation purposes, you will need authorization from the host countries. Right? But authorized credits can be used for any purposes. Um, so you can imagine this particular flow chart. Um, a country that authorizes credits for CA will, be, it will generate ITMOS, and this ITMOS can be used towards NDC, COSIA, and even actually voluntary carbon market. Right? But the prevailing view is that corresponding adjustments is not required. What then is a mitigating approach is that um, you need to label transparently. Insofar as the credits are being used towards corporate voluntary targets, the label should indicate that these credits will also contribute to the host country's NDC. Um, and for many developing countries, this is also an important source of climate finance. Right, um, for them to actually deploy uh, uh, decarbonization solutions and help them achieve their NDCs. There are other uses for which you might not require authorization of carbon credits for domestic schemes. Um, in the example that I mentioned earlier, if let's say my carbon price currently covers only industry and I want to generate carbon offsets from uh, my land sector, right, um, that provides some flexibility for uh, industry to actually use offsets within a domestic scheme. And overall, it actually benefits the country. Uh, and they could potentially use some of these international standards and mechanisms to actually generate carbon credits because these international standards would have robust methodologies and robust uh, processes within them. Um, and of course, uh, they can also use um, some of these credits generated as a form of results-based finance, but uh, that means that the credits are not claimed towards any targets. Um, that, is from, uh, that, that is what the Article 6 rule says. Um, over time, uh, we do think that there is going to be a convergence and regulators might tighten domestic policies around consumer claims and consumer marketing laws. So this is a space to watch out for. Right? Uh, today, we are already seeing um, SEC requiring corporate disclosures uh, aligned with TCFD, uh, including the use of their carbon credits. Um, over time, I think the first step is always transparency, and then you'll get some enforcement and regulation. Um, so the next couple of slides kind of covers the trends and outlook for the carbon credit market. Um, so everyone knows uh, the carbon credit market is, has evolved rapidly. Uh, there's a surge in the demand and the prices, uh, and today it's quadruple in value, and a lot of this is actually from uh, nature-based solutions uh, that has generated quite a lot of demand, uh, and driven by net zero targets and also carbon neutral products. Uh, we also see a strong price spread across uh, different project types uh, based on uh, certain attributes. So for example, a renewable energy project, a solar project might fetch about $4 uh, per ton in the market today. Whereas a removal credit, because of the net zero demand, right, uh, it might fetch about $14. So there's a spread based on the different project types. Uh, following COP26 last year, uh, we saw an upsurge, uh, uptick in the carbon market activity. Prices went up significantly. And then earlier this year, you kind of corrected. Um, there was a bit of a price uh, crash uh, after the uh, invasion of Ukraine. Uh, but over the past couple of months, at least in my view, we've kind of seen prices stabilize. Remains to be seen what will be the impact of COP27 on um, the market itself. As I mentioned, credits from nature-based solutions make up about half of the total number of credits uh, that have been issued. Um, and these cover both uh, Red Plus credits, uh, improved forest management, as well as afforestation and reforestation activities that represent removal credits. And how are carbon credits priced? Uh, there are different factors. There's the project type, uh, which standard it's being issued under. So you will observe some of the standards that uh, claim to have high integrity or have very strong sustainable development co-benefits like gold standard. They tend to be priced higher than other kind of credits in the market. 
uh, project types, removals tend to fetch a higher price, uh, as well as nature-based solutions. Uh, they are preferred by buyers. Um, Co-benefits well, is also a very important attribute. So it must tell a story. Um, it helps local communities, it helps uh, biodiversity, conservation, uh, and there are many different dimensions to this. Uh, location is also important. It's not just uh, where you are sited, but also your climate profile. Um, the stronger you are in terms of your ambition, ironically, um, it is actually a, a more attractive uh, prospect for uh, buyers and investors because the risk of um, selling junk credits or credits that do not represent real emission reductions is lower. Uh, and finally, I want to stress on the point of vintage. Right? Um, so the vintage of credits is a very tricky issue under the Article 6 negotiations and the carbon markets more generally. Uh, but newer credits with uh, newer vintages, vintages represent credits with emission reductions that occur in that particular year. Right, so newer vintages will be, in, will be sought after more than older vintages. Because the perception is that um, some of the older projects and methodologies were outdated and didn't take into account some of the developments uh, since Paris Agreement. Um, despite the volatility that we see today, um, the demand remains strong and we are likely to see the voluntary carbon market to remain resilient over time. Uh, some estimates based on different assumptions estimate prices to be about $20 to $50 by 2030. Um, the chart that you see here, um, the, blue, the blue line essentially shows a scenario where there's a strong pivot towards SBTI net zero standard, which only requires uh, removal credits, um, uh, a sharp increase in 20, after 2030 uh, where prices will go up to about $200 and then subsequently go down as more removal technologies are being deployed and supply increases over time. Um, there was also a recent study that estimates the demand from countries towards their NDC. This is a bit of a black box because actually countries' NDCs do not, they are not required to disclose how much they want to buy and how much they want to sell. Right? All they need to say is, um, I will participate in Article 6 to meet my NDC target or I want to participate as a seller, supplier, right? Um, uh, and some of the assumptions taken were that um, it, it assumes a certain percentage of um, shortfall in terms of your NDC target that you need to meet towards your uh, NDC. Uh, and it's quite sizable, uh, but of course, different assumptions, and we don't really know the actual numbers unless uh, countries are transparent about it. And this would create demand generally for credits with corresponding adjustments, which is where the opportunities for Article 6 lie. Um, not just for countries' NDC, but also towards COSIA. So for Gen Zero, with our $5 billion initial capital, uh, we deploy across decarbonization solutions. Uh, there are many different modalities in which we deploy our capital, uh, but there are four strategic moves um, that we are move making moving forward. One, um, we want to try and bring nascent technology to market, and how can carbon markets help? Right, use carbon credits as a financial me mechanism to lower the green premium of climate technologies. This will include uh, removal type technologies like biochar, uh, green hydrogen, and sustainable aviation fuel. Um, second, credits with corresponding adjustment, which is also a fairly nascent issue. And this requires very strong public-private partnership uh, in trying to understand whether the credits represent um, reductions that are additional to the NDC, Right, um, that they can stand up to international scrutiny. Um, for Gen Zero itself, uh, because we invest across the ecosystem, we can partner with our ecosystem partners. Of course, it's not an exclusive relationship, but you can imagine a model or archetype where we work with governments under a broader G2G framework to try and better understand what would be project types that would be eligible under Article 6. Uh, Gen Zero would finance the project and then we work with project developers to originate. Um, of course, Article 6 comes with a lot of regulatory risks and commercial risks also for us. Um, we don't want a situation where we put in upfront capital um, with uh, a situation or a scenario downstream where we do not get authorization, right? Um, we, so these are some of the risks that we face and there are measures uh, to try and mitigate this. So it's very key that there's actually policy clarity in terms of what would be uh, suitable for Article 6 uh, origination. 
The third one, um, also operational capabilities to work with our ecosystem partners to try and scale up some of these things and generate new quality supply in the market. And finally, thought leadership. So we want to work with think tanks, um, tertiary institutes to try and um, bring more clarity and um, bring more thought leadership on frontier and nascent topics uh, around carbon markets. One of the things that we are working on is how do we unpack this whole notion of net zero because it's a fairly uh, universal term, but sometimes you commit to something without knowing what it means to you, right? Um, at least from a Singapore approach, uh, when you develop a target, it's always bottom up, trying to understand what is actually feasible. Sometimes uh, it can be top down, and what it entails can be quite tricky uh, in terms of the pathway and decarbonization journey towards net zero. But in short, carbon markets can play a role in the decarbonization. A uh, strong and robust carbon markets can actually help to catalyze uh, new technologies and deploy capital where it's needed uh, to help towards a global net zero target. But a carbon market um, where there is severe integrity issues can actually undo everything as we've seen in the past. Um, so I close with that, I end with that, and thank you so much. Um, this is uh, just an example of um, pilots that are happening. Uh, I just want to make a mention that um, some of the tools and solutions developed by NUS around carbon prospecting has actually had practical applications. Uh, when we actually do our due diligence in terms of looking at the carbon potential of projects, uh, we actually look at um, some of these uh, solutions out there to see what, what is the potential and see where, where the potential areas or risks are. Um, so uh, thank you so much for that uh, particular platform and the carbon prospecting platform, and I wish everyone the best. Thanks. Okay. Um, okay, thank you so much, Anshari, for that wonderful sharing. And now we move into um, the panel discussion, um, and I'd like to invite our speakers back up to the stage. Um, you can take these three seats, and I'll take the, the one at the very far end, and the mics will turn on at the bottom. All right, I hope you're ready. <laughs> okay, have a sip of water first. The tough questions are coming, right? Okay. So, um, thank you all very much for your opening remarks and your presentations. Um, I would love to start with Prof. Ko, the very far end. Um, so, as the speakers have shared earlier, Article 6 negotiations have paved the way for countries to trade carbon credits to meet their goals. And uh, as was also mentioned, uh, one source is nature-based carbon credits or nature-based solutions. Uh, including saving a forest from the X uh, in one place or reforesting uh, an area somewhere else. Um, so I'd like to ask you, what, uh, can all nature-based carbon projects be considered sources of carbon credits? Why or why not? Uh, thanks, thanks, Melissa, for that question. Um, that, that's a very good question. Uh, when we talk about nature-based solutions, uh, I think some of us may think that uh, on all forests uh, could be nature-based solutions or all reforestation projects uh, would nat nat naturally be re uh, nature-based solutions. Well, in one sense, they, they are, all of them are, but whether or not they could be funded uh, through market-based mechanisms as nature-based solutions is another question. Um, and that has a lot to do with additionality. Uh, and that is the uh, issue of whether uh, the intervention uh, could have happened, uh, could have brought about those benefits uh, uh, if, if not for the resourcing or, or the intervention that supported the intervention or the intervention that set that, uh, itself. In other words, uh, we need to understand uh, what the business as usual scenario would be, would have been if, if not for that intervention. Uh, only projects that um, have that additionality or interventions that have an additionality uh, can be or would be supported as, uh, as uh, market-based uh, uh, funded uh, nature-based solutions. Um, but, that, but additionality is only one aspect of the, of the consideration. The other considerations would be uh, the issue of uh, permanence. Now, even if a project is, uh, has, has added value or has additionality and could be supported by you know, carbon finance me me mechanisms, uh, we still need to understand uh, whether that project uh, will be around for the next 10, 20, 30 years uh, within the uh, intended uh, lifespan of the project. 
but even that is not the full picture. We also need to understand, and this is a really challenging thing, what would happen, what will happen after the project appear has ended, you know, after the financing has uh, been deployed to protect the forest, for example, uh, for the next 30 years, what's going to happen to the carbon in the forest, or who will continue to protect it. So, so those are also important considerations, and there are ways uh, to, to resolve or mitigate uh, uh, and address some of these uh, risks uh, or challenging questions, um, uh, but they are still very valid um, you know, operations and research questions uh, to be tackled. Um, so in that sense, and it's in that context uh, where uh, that we at the Center for Nature-Based Climate Solutions and our colleagues from all over the world are developing new methodologies and new technologies to help inform policy and business uh, decisions on, um, on some of these questions. The last uh, slide that you saw where uh, Anshari very kindly uh, gave us a plug on our carbon prospecting tool. And I'll give you an even better plot. You go to the website. The website is called uh, carbonprospecting.org. So we, we, we have uh, launched that tool yet, uh, last week at uh, Climate Week in New York. It's completely open access. It's uh, freely available. And uh, it's, it's based on real uh, peer-reviewed science. So what that tool does is it helps, as the name suggests, it helps potential investors and policy uh, makers uh, understand uh, the potential of any site you know, across the, the, the tropics, essentially, any site um, in terms of the amount of uh, carbon credits that could be generated. So the, the, the carbon credits that could be funded by market-based me mechanisms, the amount of uh, financial returns on investment that the investor could be expecting, as well as the co-benefits uh, that, that could be delivered uh, by implementing that project. So, uh, all of those issues have been raised by the previous uh, speaker. So uh, that, in that way, uh, science and technology uh, are very important uh, uh, areas to invest in to help inform uh, these very important decisions. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Ko. So what I'm hearing also is that it, uh, carbon prospecting uh, has something to do with profitability of the nature-based solutions. And with that, I'd like to turn to Anshari. Um, so, of course, investors won't just put money into projects that won't yield returns. So, um, perhaps we can get your opinion about, um, other than carbon prices and the returns, how will innovations uh, such as this new carbon prospecting tool help investors uh, decide on whether to fund the project? Uh, uh, so for Gen Zero itself, um, yes, we do need returns above our cost of capital, right? but it's across our portfolio. Um, there, there's double bottom line, so it's returns above our cost of capital, but also climate impact. So we will not invest where it does not deliver climate impact. And climate impact itself is a fairly new issue um, in terms of measurement. How do you measure the climate impact of a direct investment versus a catalytic investment? Right. Um, but in terms of projects itself, if let's say it's a nature-based project, there are several areas in which uh, some of these innovations could really be helpful, particularly those that enhance MRV, um, those that reduce transactional costs. Right. So we have invested in perennial that can help to enhance some of this MRV um, uh, in soil, soil carbon. Right. Um, so solutions like the Carbon Prospecting website does give a fairly good snapshot uh, in terms of what is the carbon potential um, across the tropical belt. Uh, there are others that we will need to leverage on once actually the carbon credits go through the validation, verification, issuance, MRV stage. Um, but I think all in all, because a lot of the projects itself, they have very long lead times and long crediting periods. And today, because of the huge demand, we are also observing a bottleneck in the market Right. Um, so how can some of these solutions actually help to enhance precision, but also the speed and lower transactional costs? Because um, the cost itself can actually be delivered back to the local communities. That's very interesting. Thank you, Anshari. Um, I'd like to move to Ruben now. Um, so demand for nature-based carbon credits, uh, as I think was alluded to in the presentations earlier, is likely to outstrip supply. So demand outstripping supply. Uh, can you share with us what kind of projects uh, or what kind of credits 
if you can, the Singapore government might be looking for. Um, and this actually comes from a question that the audience posed to us in the registration form. So, um, specifically the question is, which are the countries, again if you can answer, uh, that Singapore is looking to secure deals with? I think you gave us a, a sneak peek at that. And how likely are these projects or these collaborations going to bear fruit in the next 12 months? Okay, so, um, so maybe I'll share first. I think, I think you're alluding to what is our uh, environmental integrity criteria uh, that the government sets for credits that uh, we procure. Uh, I think this goes back to what is our philosophy with regard to credits. And I think Anchari made a good point that uh, a market is uh, only as credible as how it's perceived to be. Uh, and Singapore has a very strong interest in preserving um, the carbon markets to be credible because it is, it is a solution that uh, we have publicly made known that we will rely on to reach our net zero goals uh, because of our constraints. So uh, with that in mind, um, our position with regard to environmental integrity credits is that we will only consider uh, credits that have very high environmental integrity. Now then the natural question is what is very high environmental integrity? Um, there, we are currently in the process and uh, actually the, uh, very at the final stages of um, releasing that criteria, uh, but it's not rocket science in how we typically do things. Right? So we look at available standards, um, what is recognized inter internationally, uh, what is seen to be credible. Uh, we reference those and those will form a key component of what uh, Singapore recognizes to be um, good enough for us to contribute to as our, our NDC. Um, for example, um, recently um, the National Environment Agency signed the MOU um, with VERA and Gold Standard. Um, and I guess among other things that sort of alludes to uh, what would be a minimum baseline but need not necessarily be the baseline um, for what is considered to be uh, high environmental integrity credits. Okay, uh, thank you. Are you. Do you have some more? Anshari? Yeah, just to add on, right? Quality is a very subjective term. And um, it's very difficult, uh, especially for those that have not been in the market for very long to understand the technicalities around what is high quality and what's low quality. And which is why today also we are observing um, ratings agencies come up to try and better uh, assess uh, the risks of things like additionality, non permanence, leakage. Uh, for some of these credits and what is considered to be like investment grade. At the macro level, there are initiatives. Um, Article 6 is one. I think in terms of global rules and international confidence on the market is um, in, against a backdrop of very low confidence and a very weak market under the Kyoto Protocol. Right? So Article 6 rule, that's why there was a six-year logjam. Um, and finally, we got something that, at least my perception, the international community accept for across the board, private sector, governments, and potentially also NGOs, right? Uh, to be a good trade-off in terms of some of the difficult pain points in the market. Um, what Article 6.2 doesn't do is to define exactly the quality that qualifies as an ITMO. So it is up to the Singapore government and its partner government to justify that this is quality and represents emission reductions that are real, additional, permanent. What is the benchmark that they use? could be some kind of uh, international framework, right? For example, COSIA under the ICAO represents a multilateral um, uh, effort on setting a quality uh, benchmark. In the voluntary carbon market space, there are others. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, on the demand and supply side, you've got the voluntary carbon market initiative that looks at the kind of credible claims that you can make. Um, there is a mitigation hierarchy in terms of principles that a corporate can take today in terms of abating across your scope 1, scope 2, scope 3 emissions and then relying on uh, offsets for those hard to abate emissions. Right? Um, and then there's also on the supply side, the Integrity Council for the Voluntary Carbon Market where they just close the consultations. On top of that, you've got all the different standards. You've got VERA Gold Standard, which have come up in early 2000s, right? and over the course of the decades, they've actually gained a lot of experience and developed very robust methodologies and safeguards around how to address some of the quality concerns. Um, so there's uh, many different layers really to enhance confidence in the market 
and it is also a buyer's beware principle. You need to know what you want to buy, uh, you need to know what it delivers, and you need to do your own due diligence. Okay, Prof, do you have anything to add on integrity? Uh, uh, yeah, so, so maybe, maybe just on the point of uh, subjectivity that uh, Shari mentioned, uh, that there are also different um, uh, aspects of that or dimensionality of that. Right? Um, what is high quality to someone concerned about climate change, primarily concerned about climate change, may be different than someone concerned about biodiversity or someone concerned about the impacts or benefits, positive or negative, to the local communities who would be impacted or affected by the carbon project. So all those different dimensions could be considered when we are looking at the quality or, or, or integrity of a, of a carbon project. Um, uh, yeah, so maybe I'll, I'll stop there, yeah. Okay, um, thank you. All right, so this is your time to shine. If you have any questions, you can raise your hand and my colleagues Annabelle, uh, Annabelle and Abigail will be passing the mics across to you depending where you are. And I would love to invite you to, if you have a question, please identify yourself um, and inform us to whom you would like to pose the question to and then ask your question. Um, so anyone over there, please. Uh, I'll call. Oh. Ruben, Anshari, Marisa, good evening. Uh, my name is Howie. I, uh, I, I'm a professional carbon analyst for a corporation. So thank you for the insights. I think that was a, a good refresher of what I'm supposed to look at again. Uh, about, it's about a year now. I remember going to COP26, I was keenly looking at uh, what are the structures that will come out from Article 6. So 6.2, 6.4, ITMO, CAs, those were good, but I think there are still a lot of questions in my head as to how this is going to be executed. Um, how do you avoid double counting between national registry and private registry? Can you transfer NDCs within the same country from national registry to private registry if there's excess? Uh, can you move, even if it's a, if it's a bilet uh, agreement, can you move NDCs from country A to country B and then to country C? Uh, does your state-owned state enterprises have a stick in the NDCs, for example? There are so many questions about that. So uh, my question to Prof. Cole and Ruben, I guess you two would be at COP27 the most, uh, would be what would you consider to be a big win for Article 6 negotiations this year? I think Ruben should start first. <laughs> yeah, I'll let the negotiator start. Uh, thank you. Thanks for that question. There's a lot to unpack in that. Um, but maybe I'll take a step at it. So um, on the specific point of what to expect for COP27 and what is a good outcome, I mean, uh, like EI, like environmental integrity criteria, uh, a good outcome is also subjective. So I'll speak from Singapore's perspective. Um, so from Singapore's perspective, what would be a good outcome for COP27 uh, would be to get a clear guidance on the transparency requirements uh, for uh, the, the various Article 6 mechanisms. Right? I'm speaking about this broadly, but this, this trans specifically this translates to we're supposed to agree on a set of guidelines on what exactly is to be reported when parties engage in um, Article 6.2 transactions, for example. Uh, this is of interest to us because, uh, going back to the earlier point, the, the market is as good as only as only, only as good as it's perceived to be, right? So, and a transparent market is what we want and what we want to encourage. And um, having clear guidelines on what needs to be reported and for parties to report according to those guidelines is in our interest. So, among other things, um, uh, the achievement of uh, very clear reporting guidelines uh, at COP27 uh, would be a good outcome uh, from, from Singapore's perspective. Um, and just to um, build on that point further, uh, it's not just COP27 and the COP outcomes that can engineer success. So for example, there are initiatives that, um, that, that are outside the UNFCCC system that can engineer success and they can promote that uh, transparency, accountability that enables uh, a functioning market. So for example, um, Singapore uh, has invested uh, together with the World Bank and AITA on the Climate Warehouse Initiative 
that exactly speaks to what you spoke to, but how do we have transparency, accountability, and traceability of carbon credits across different registries, whether they be voluntary or national registries. And so that is essentially using blockchain technology uh, to trace carbon credits and account for them throughout so that there's greater transparency regardless of where the credit is being traded that allows that, that, uh, that you to follow the credits when it goes to country A across platforms before going to country B up till retirement. So these are one of the ways. Another way, for example, I, I, I alluded to it earlier where we, the, our NEA had a MOU with VERA and Gold Standard. Essentially, the purpose of the MOU is to align taxonomies between registries so that um, people know what you're talking about, right? Because currently, you have your different platforms that have different terminologies. So you need convergence among these technologies so that you know what retirement means, for example and, and uh, what the various terms of registries use so that to a person that's looking at it, there's consistency across registries. So I guess the point I'm, I'm trying to allude to is that beyond good outcomes at um, COP27, um, there are good outcomes to be achieved beyond those as well. And uh, Singapore is actively pursuing those um, channels as well. Thanks, Ruben. Yeah. Um, okay. So, so I'm I'm going to s maybe complement uh, what Ruben said by emphasizing about focusing on other things, uh, other aspects of that question. Uh, I'm I'm actually not a climate scientist. I'm I'm a I'm a applied ecologist and a conservation scientist that got concerned enough about climate change to to move into this space. Uh, so, but my focus and interest has always been more on the biodiversity side of things, the natural environment. So, and then also on science, obviously, being a scientist. So, so I think one good outcome for me would be to see the negotiations and the different stakeholders pay more attention on, uh, on the importance of science or the use of science uh, in informing some of these discussions, especially in terms of uh, increasing the transparency of uh, how they would be you know, for example, assessing the, the, the quality or integrity of a project or product of that project. Um, so so that, that speaks to the science uh, and, and maybe hoping to get more um, uh, appreciation of, of the need to, 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 to invest and, and to make fuller use of the science uh, uh, to inform those decisions. Then uh, maybe more specifically, also uh, hope to see more emphasis on biodiversity. Um, and maybe moving the lens slightly away from, um, or not moving away, but expanding the lens to, to look at things beyond carbon or, or beyond the, the lens of just carbon to also look at biodiversity. Because if we do that, or once we do that, looking at uh, the issue through the lens of biodiversity, we would uh, realize that actually um, the carbon market cannot help to protect the vast majority of biodiversity and our natural ecosystems that, that, that need saving or they are threatened. So there would need to be a, a lot of other mechanisms, other interventions, non-market-based ones that the regulators will need to be thinking about uh, to implement to protect the vast majority of ecosystems that are threatened and cannot be protected uh, by market-based mechanisms. And Charlie, I'm sure you have something. <laughs> yeah, um, although I wasn't asked, but I'll respond to the question. <laughs> Uh, one of my expectations or what I see would be a good outcome um, is some progress on Article 6.4, right? Some good decisions on getting it to be operationalized and some key decisions made by the supervisory body. I think it's very important that 6.4 progress well because it delivers a signal that at least at the multilateral level, um, some of these mechanisms can provide an option for countries but potentially also for the private sector uh, to look at um, a new multilateral standard um, it's very different from CDM and very different from the VERAS and GOAL standard. They have um, levies around adaptation that can deliver adaptation core benefits. There are levies around overall mitigation of global emissions, which is a, short, um, a long form of a discount factor so that the environment benefits from the transactions. Right? Um, and also the baseline approaches are more robust. But how they strike a balance across the views and positions of different countries to find something that's robust and credible would be quite key. And 6.4 could evolve to be a new benchmark in terms of a quality standard if it 
proceeds well. It needs to be grounded um, with reality also. For project developers, they will be looking at across the standards that <coughs> claim to be credible and can generate carbon credits. Um, will there be additional steps that are more onerous for them? Uh, what would be the carbon yield uh, coming out from particular projects that are registered in 6.4 versus 6.2? But if that's a very strong demand signal for 6.4 credits, I think that, that could be a good signal for the market overall, and also for trust in the multilateral system. It's a great question, Howie, and you hit all three of them, so great. Okay, in the interest of time, I'll take the questions together. So Kai Heng and... Hi, uh, thanks all three for the sharing, I learned a lot. So I'm um, Kai Heng from Enterprise Singapore looking at energy companies. But this question is more of uh, for infrastructure in general, not just for energy infrastructure projects. So the question is, um, there are a lot of marginally bankable projects regional, in the region right now. And how ready are carbon credits in financing these projects? And what are the challenges in deploying carbon credits for these projects? Like capacity or, or what, what, what really is stopping it? Thanks for the question, and there's one in the middle here, if you don't mind passing it, the mic across. Uh, hi, my name is Someka. I am from Timasik Life Science Laboratories, and I am a plant biotechnologist. So my question is regarding carbon credits from a green project, for example, planting trees. So as Prof. Ko mentioned, that there's one type in which you can do the forestation, say for 20 years, and after that, the trees are there other project is you plant trees like uh, teak. So after 20 years, you can harvest those trees and the carbon still remains in the furniture. The third type is whether you have trees like uh, uh, for latex, for example, rubber, uh, rubber or fruit trees. So from an investor point of view, which type of these green project do you think is more profitable? One which is just left there uh, after the project where the carbon just go, grows. Other project is you harvest the carbon from the teak and then you replant the area. And third is where the trees are there, you just take the fruits. Thank you. Thanks for the question. Um, anybody else? Last call. Last call for questions. Okay, we have one right over here. Hello, thank you so much for your sharing. Um, my question is around nature-based carbon credits. So we all talked about carbon credit demand outweighing carbon credit supply. So the question was um, around developing uh, and funding around pre-feasibility projects so that they're investable. We understand that it's still lacking investment and a lot of it is still depending on philanthropy. So my question is whether or not uh, there are commitments, especially financial commitments, to help build this pipeline. I hope that was clear. Were the three questions clear? All right. Who would like to address those questions? I think a lot of them were addressed to you, actually. Yeah. So, so on the first question, I think about bankability of new types of technologies. I think the idea is that carbon market is not the silver bullet to bring down the cost entirely, but it can be a catalyst. Um, it can bring down the green premium to a certain extent, a salary deployment. Uh, to a point where it reaches cost parity with um, the BAU um, and the current alternatives, uh, which could be very carbon intensive. That is precisely the case around renewables a decade ago, right? Uh, how carbon markets help to catalyze deployment of solar, wind, and hydro in developing countries. Of course, you can go down the rabbit hole of uh, assessing the integrity quality of that particular hydropower dam or project or, or wind project or solar project. But that is the value proposition of carbon markets. How from bringing, cost, bringing down the cost uh, uh, parity from 2040 to maybe 2030. Uh, and then, of course, the additionality considerations will need to be reviewed because then if it reaches cost parity with other co carbon intensive alternatives, then would markets be the best platform to actually scale up? Um, that is the thesis that we are also trying to test out for um, nascent kind of technologies um, in green in green building materials uh, and also uh, potentially carbon capture uh, or even green hydrogen. Um, but um, there's a lot of uh, intricacies around it, including the accounting. Right? Um, one good example is it still considered green if you. Um, actually sell offsets that are being used by another party. So, so the accounting bit needs to be clarified and it needs to be 
kosher. It needs to be good enough um, and instill confidence. Um, but there is a role. Uh, there's also a demand side. Is there actually going to be a buyer who's going to buy $100 per ton credit? Uh, you never know. Because today, sometimes the demand is based on willingness to buy more so than um, the actual market trends itself. Um, I think on the second question around what type of trees I prefer, definitely native species. <laughs> uh, but, but for us, uh, we, we are fairly agnostic. So we also look at sustainable uh, forestry. Um, so sustainable forestry management, IFM kind of projects, uh, agriculture projects also. Because we think today, given the urgency of climate action, um, all kinds of solutions need to be explored. And there are benefits to exploring different types, right? And different kinds of projects would deliver different kinds of benefits. A forest that's kept intact can preserve a whole ecosystem of biodiversity and endangered species, right? Versus a forest that's a monoculture um, that could be invasive species could actually be more detrimental even though it's a removal project. So all these considerations um, needs to be understood in a more um, deeper level to understand what are the risks and you don't create perverse uh, incentives for such things. Uh. But um, for now, um, we are looking across the entire nature-based stack of solutions because we think nature-based solutions are super essential. Even though in the voluntary carbon market space, they are considered um, uh, avoidance for, for example, red plush projects, they are considered avoidance, right? It's not afforestation or reforestation, but they're still very essential for, for the, from the biodiversity angle, as Brocco mentioned. I think the third question is on investment in pre-feasibility stage. Um, it is, of course, uh, as an investor, you will appreciate, it will present higher risk for us, right? Um, without that certainty of um, the feasibility of actually originating that project, um, but increasingly, I think today, in this space, we are actually seeing a lot of capital going into pre-feasibility uh, stages, uh, simply because there's a huge demand for uh, nature-based solutions and investors coming in with a longer-term view to secure credits, uh, and therefore, they are coming in more uh, even early on uh, in terms of investing in pre-feasibility stage. Um, so I think the capital source will not just be from philanthropy, uh, I think what's more important actually is to look at a blended financing infrastructure, right? So not just um, concessional grants, but also commercial debt uh, and potentially sources from uh, governments also to try and ensure uh, there's a diversified approach towards um, uh, these kind of investments. Yeah. That is a, oh, just to add, we're actually exploring that kind of blended financing arrangements on an agriculture project. I won't share where, but potentially if it works, potentially with DFIs, MDBs, and also other banks, um, together with local stakeholders, uh, that model can potentially be replicated elsewhere and scaled up elsewhere also. Yeah, yeah I Thank think you, sorry. No worries, no worries at all. Uh, well, I think that's a great note to end off on so you guys can continue networking and finishing up our food outside so there's zero food waste. Um, but uh, I also want to just, before we end, make a quick plug for our second and third lecture series uh, in this three-part series, right? So the, sec the next lecture will be held on the 27th of October, uh, same timing, same place, uh, and it will be what to expect at COP27. I know we covered a little bit here today, but we're going, we'll be going broader, talking about the other agenda items, and we have WWF to come and share with us. Uh, and the final lecture in the series is on the 1st of December after we come back from COP27 uh, and we will be talking about uh, the outcomes and the implications for research and education. So I hope that you will join us and do look out for uh, the flyers, brochures and uh, registration links that will go up. And I just want to say also that the recording of this session will be put on our Centre for Nature-Based Climate Solutions YouTube page. Uh, sometime soon uh, after this. And now I'd like to invite you to join me in thanking our wonderful panelists uh, for their <laughs> insightful remarks. And thank you very much for joining us. Uh, this marks the end of this lecture series. Thank you very much.